think about the Swampland program, we imagine that we have some theory space, some space of self-consistent, low-energy effective theories in which we have this nice landscape, uh, this subset that is ultraviolet completable in quantum gravity and string theory in particular. So what we ask ourselves is how do we define uh, this boundary between the landscape and the swampland? And what we do normally in practice is, as we should, look at examples from uh, the well-defined theory of quantum gravity that string theory gives us. So the most celebrated example of this uh, approach is the weak gravity conjecture that uh, Kumran and Nima and collaborators uh, suggested 12 years ago. But uh, a parallel question that you can ask is, what is the set of consistent EFTs in the first place? What bounds that a priori theory space? And so there's been uh, a parallel set of results and questions people have been asking trying to bound the space of consistent EFTs purely from infrared physics principles. Uh, principles like unitarity, causality, analyticity, and you can bound all sorts of theories this way, massive gravity, et cetera, and uh, higher curvature terms. And this indeed dates back to uh, another NEMA paper from 2006 on uh, bounding d5 to the 4 and f to the 4th couplings. But in this talk, I'm not going to talk about uh, any of these other infrared uh, physics approaches, but instead introduce a new uh, IR consistency approach, namely consistency of black hole entropy, and uh, argue that we can use this to prove the weak gravity conjecture. So it's an interesting question to ask whether or not uh, the IR or an UV approach ever give the same results, that is whether or not the swampland bounds can ever be seen directly from the infrared, and I'll argue that that's sometimes the case. Uh, I won't talk about uh, Gary's uh, unitarity approach that we heard about yesterday. Uh, there are extra assumptions built into that when you add massive higher spin states. If you want the unitarity approach to work, you have to make strong assumptions about uh, the Lorentz structure of the UV completion, and those assumptions are often not true in example completions. So this argument uh, that I'll give today is actually much more general and will indeed even give the generalized form of the weak gravity conjecture for arbitrary numbers of U1s. All right. So, uh, we heard from Matt about all the various different forms of the tower and sublattice weak gravity conjectures, for, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll just be considering the weak form electric of the weak gravity conjecture, where we require the existence of some state with charge to mass ratio bigger than one in Planck units for any abelian gauge theory consistently coupled to quantum gravity. And that one is a, is a precise one. It's the one associated with uh, Q over M equals one for an extremal black hole. And the reason extremal black holes appear is, of course, historically, the weak gravity conjecture was justified by a black hole decay thought experiment. If you want a black hole to decay, it has to decay to something with larger charge to mass ratio just by kinematics and charge conservation. So if you want extremal black holes to decay, you need some lighter state that has Q over M bigger than one. Now, why black holes should decay involves various pathologies with black hole remnants that I won't have time to get into. This is not a proof, but it's a, it's a very compelling uh, thought experiment. And so you should keep in the back of your mind just the moral that the weak gravity conjecture wants black holes to be able to decay. All right, so let's get into uh, how we'll argue for the weak gravity conjecture by a thermodynamics thought experiment. So we're considering uh, a black hole with charge Q and mass M as measured at infinity. And we want to compute its entropy, but we want to compare its entropy in two different theories. One theory is pure Einstein-Maxwell up to the Stringer Planck scale, so it's just the pure Einstein-Maxwell theory plus uh, slop terms suppressed by uh, the string scale, for example. The other theory is Einstein-Maxwell plus higher derivative terms, higher derivative terms that are uh, introduced by integrating out all the massive states in the theory. So in the theory on the right, uh, I'm considering a theory that's below uh, the mass gap. So it's just the photon and graviton uh, interacting via higher dimension operators. So we want to compare the entropy in the two theories and compute this quantity uh, delta s. And what you might imagine, and what I'll later argue rigorously is true, is that delta s is positive. Heuristically, you might imagine that delta s is positive because we've added more states in the QFT and we've integrated them out, so there are extra microstates. Uh, that's the intuition, but that's not the strict proof of why delta S is positive. All right, uh, why does the entropy change? Uh, the entropy changes uh, for two reasons. So in the theory on the left, the entropy is just the usual Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, the area over 4G, uh, 
In the theory on the right, uh, the higher dimension operators uh, just give you explicit extra contributions to the entropy from the walled terms in the action. But there's another contribution. Since we're holding the black hole charge and mass fixed at infinity, but since we're adding higher derivative terms to the action, the Einstein equations and the Maxwell uh, equations change, and so the black hole radius is slightly different. And so its area is different, and that also gives a contribution to the entropy. So we'll need to actually take into account both of those effects. All right, the action that we're writing down is just the most general uh, effective theory of a photon and graviton uh, that you can write down. So there are three r squared terms, three rf squared terms, and two f to the fourth terms. And so what we'll do uh, for the bulk of this talk is just prove a family of positivity bounds on the CI, on the higher dimension operator coefficients, which a priori won't sound like it has anything to do with the weak gravity conjecture, but the weak gravity conjecture will come in at the end in a somewhat surprising way. All right, so we want to bound the CIs. But for now, uh, let's first just prove that delta S is positive when we, when we add these higher curvature terms to the action. All right, so let me just state all my assumptions really explicitly. We're assuming uh, that there exists quantum fields phi at some mass scale m phi, uh, where m phi is below the scale lambda at which QFT breaks down. So lambda, if you like, is the string scale. And phi, uh, the quant those quantum fields aren't necessarily a scalar. I'll just write them as phi for convenience. They can have arbitrary spin. They can couple uh, with arbitrary uh, types of Lorentz contractions to uh, the curvature or to uh, the gauge field. But I'll, I'll be assuming uh, that the fields phi couple in such a way that the higher dimension operators are generated classically, i.e. at tree level. So they couple like phi times uh, the Riemann tensor with some contraction or phi times F squared with some Lorentz contraction. Uh, so the CIs will go as 1 over m phi squared, which is much, much bigger than the quantum gravity slop terms, the 1 over lambda squared terms that I'm dropping from the pure Einstein-Hilbert action. And couplings like this are, are very generic in string theory. This is actually a very, very weak assumption. For example, uh, as soon as you break Susie below the string scale, uh, the dilaton gets a mass, and the dilaton likes to couple to R like this. So, so couplings uh, that generate higher dimension operators at tree level are, are quite generic. Finally, uh, for technical reasons that will become clear, we'll be considering a black hole with charge large enough that the specific heat is positive. For a Schwarzschild black hole, of course, the specific heat is negative, but if you crank up the charge uh, before you hit the extremal point, you pass through uh, a point where the charge uh, is high enough that the specific heat is positive. And in d equals 4, that happens when q over m is bigger than root 3 over 2. All right, so we'll compute the entropy using the Euclidean path integral argument uh, developed by Stephen Hawking and collaborators. So I'll just write the partition function z of beta as some uh, path integral over e to the minus i, where i is the Euclidean action of the effective theory, i tilde is the Euclidean action of the pure Einstein-Maxwell theory, and beta is the inverse temperature of a black hole of mass m in the, in the corrected theory. All right, so formally I can write uh, I can write I as just the path integral over some UV uh, Euclidean action. So this action lives at a scale above m phi. So I've just done the path integral over, over all the phi fields that I integrated out to generate the higher dimension operators. Now, formally, I can, I can evaluate that UV Euclidean action at any uh, field configuration I like and ask, and ask what I get. Uh, in particular, if I pin all the phi fields to zero and evaluate at some arbitrary metric and gauge configuration, then the UV Euclidean action just mathematically equals uh, the pure Einstein-Maxwell Euclidean action evaluated at that same field configuration because I've turned off all the phi fields. Uh, this fact will be important. All right, so now let's prove our uh, inequality. So just by the saddle point approximation, minus log z of beta equals the UV uh, Euclidean action evaluated at, uh, at the classical solutions, g beta, a beta, phi beta. Now, if that extremum is a local minimum, uh, I'll discuss that shortly, but if it's a local minimum, then that's less than the UV Euclidean action evaluated at some other field configuration which by the relation I just proved, uh, that equals the pure Einstein-Maxwell Euclidean action evaluated at that same configuration, which by the saddle point approximation again equals minus log z tilde of beta, where here z tilde of beta is uh, the, the free energy at, uh, in the pure Einstein-Maxwell theory at a temperature beta 
so the mass has been adjusted such that the temperature is the same temperature as in the, as in the modified theory. So importantly, z tilde of beta does not equal z tilde of beta tilde. We have to keep track of the temperature shift, which we can write in terms of delta s using some uh, thermodynamic identities. And putting this all together, recalling other thermodynamic identities, uh, our free energy inequality just becomes delta S is positive, which is what we wanted. So the one additional assumption I used was that uh, the saddle point was a local minimum. But that's actually been shown in the literature that I won't have time to get into. Uh, even though there's a negative mode for the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, the, the conformal negative mode has been shown to be a gauge artifact that you can do an orthogonal decomposition of the metric and uh, do a different wick rotation and integrate out separately, as shown by Hawking and friends. Uh, the bona fide instability in the Euclidean short shield black hole has been shown to always be connected with negative specific heat. And so if I choose a black hole with positive specific heat, so Q over M large enough, that negative mode goes away. And indeed, uh, the saddle point is a local minimum. So we, we have a proof that delta S is positive. All that remains now is to compute delta S in the two theories and get our positivity bound. All right. So remember, C123 were the... Uh, higher dimension operator coefficients for R squared, C456 were the RF squared terms, and C78 are the F to the fourth terms. I'll just rescale everything by the Planck mass uh, so that they all have the same uh, units, so they all go as 1 over M5 squared. Now, what we want is that uh, we, we want delta S being positive to imply a positivity bound on the DIs, but we have to make sure that that's true. We have to keep track of all the other effects of introducing uh, these extra massive states. For example, uh, Newton's constant could be renormalized, but we know how that scales with m phi. Furthermore, and introducing these uh, extra states could introduce loop corrections to the operators, but those are always smaller. Uh, the, the gauge terms go in the same way. And so we can just write out, uh, expand, and power count for a black hole of size rho. We have some Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. We have the loop correction to G Newton. We have loop corrections to delta L and we have the tree contribution to delta L. So we want this fourth term to dominate over the second and third terms. And that happens provided that we take a black hole that's large but not too large. It has to be larger than the Compton wavelength of the stuff that we integrated out in order for the EFT to uh, be consistent. But it has to be smaller than 1 over kappa m phi to the d over 2. So there's a window, and that window exists provided uh, m phi is much less than m Planck, which is what we've been assuming all along. So we take a black hole in that size window, go ahead and prove our positivity bounds, and then those bounds are true just for the operator coefficients at purely at the level of the theory, and so those bounds will be true independent of the background. All right, so our black hole spacetime is uh, Reissner Nordstrom, and we'll have to compute the corrections to the Reissner Nordstrom metric induced by all the higher dimension operators. Uh, as I said, we're computing the charge and mass as measured at infinity in the Komar formalism. So that means all the higher dimension operators don't affect uh, the definition of the mass and charge. For the rest of this talk, I'll use convenient relativist units where I've divided through by the Planck mass and by root 2 as, uh, as necessary so that Q over M equals 1 corresponds to an extremal black hole. And I'll define some parameter xi, which is root 1 minus Q squared over M squared. Uh, everything will be neater in terms of xi. So an extremal black hole corresponds to xi equals 0. A short shield black hole is xi equals 1. All right. So we want to compute uh, the perturbations to the Reissner Nordstrom metric coming from higher dimension operators. Uh, the way to do this was shown in a paper by Lubos Model and friends. Uh, so you can, you can write the TT and RR components of the metric formally uh, as integrals over uh, the Ricci tensor. You get to do this because uh, in a spherically symmetric metric, there are enough symmetries that allow the Einstein equations to be inverted. And I can think of all the higher dimension operators as just living in uh, sources in T mu nu. So we need, we need to compute uh, the extra sources in T mu nu coming from all of our extra terms in the Lagrangian. All right. There are two contributions to that. One contribution is the explicit uh, correction to Einstein's equations coming from differentiating delta L with respect to G mu nu. The other contribution comes from uh, the corrections to Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations have become nonlinear, and this affects T mu nu. So, all right, we can just go ahead and compute. Uh, it's kind of a mess, but uh, we can plug in uh, the pure Reissner Nordstrom solution to compute this to leading order in the CIs, similarly for the Maxwell terms. And when all is said and done, here's the RR component of the metric, for example. So there's the nice Reissner Nordstrom term, and then there's all this other stuff that goes like uh, the DIs. Uh, similarly, uh, the TT component of the metric looks, looks analogous. Uh, 
And we can find where the horizon is by computing where the zeros are of the R, R, and TT component of the metric. And they have the same zeros to leading order in the higher dimension operator coefficients. All right, so now let's compute the entropy. Expanding out Wald's formula, uh, there's this first term is just the zeroth order beckenstein hawking entropy. The second term is what we'll call an interaction contribution. It's the explicit contribution uh, to the entropy coming from Wald's formula, delta L uh, over, over the Riemann tensor. Then there's a horizon contribution, which will just be delta A over 4G, just the shift in the beckenstein hawking entropy coming from the fact that the black hole is either bigger or smaller than you, than you thought it would be. All right, so we need to compute those two things, add them together to get delta S, and demand that it be positive, and then get a bound on the coefficients. All right, so we can just do that explicitly. I won't go through all the details of that. But when all is said and done, we get uh, the, the shift in black hole entropy. And it scales like the background Beckenstein-Hawking entropy. Uh, it falls off as the black hole mass gets bigger. And it goes as some function of psi, the charge to mass ratio parameter, and the di's. So our thermodynamic argument proved that delta S has to be positive. And so we get a family of positivity bounds on the higher dimension operator coefficients. So this is uh, the main result of this work. Here, uh, d naught is some particular linear combination of the di's that I've defined for convenience. And so the, the bound is, lives in the three-dimensional space defined by d naught, d3, and d6. And it has to be true for all xi's. Each value of xi, that is each charge to mass ratio of the black hole, gives a new linearly independent bound. And uh, I should note that even though delta s strictly diverges when xi equals zero exactly, we can still take psi very small, uh, consistently within control of perturbation theory, provided uh, psi is much bigger than m phi over m Planck. So the, uh, the details of that are in the paper. All right, so it's, it's some funny shaped uh, convex region in d naught d3 d6 space. Uh, it's not purely just an octant of, of this cube, but uh, there's been sort of this shearing off. Let's see. I can, I can show you some projections of the space that will make it more clear. So whether d3 is positive or negative, uh, d naught has to be positive. So here, each gray region has been excluded by some black hole of some particular charge to mass ratio. So you have to live in the white region. All right. Uh, so this family of positivity bounds is interesting on its own, but there will be a connection to the weak gravity conjecture when we take the near extremal limit. So if I send psi to really small, then that complicated bound just becomes d naught is positive. And I claim that this is connected to the weak gravity conjecture. How so? Well, remember, when we add higher dimension operators to the action and thereby correct Einstein's equations, we don't just correct the metric, but we also are correcting the space of physical black holes. In pure Einstein-Maxwell theory, a black hole with no naked singularities has q over m between 0 and 1. But in the corrected theory, the physical black holes with no naked singularities have q over m between 0 and 1 plus delta z, where delta z is something that's computable in the EFT. So let's compute delta z. We can, we can do that uh, straightforwardly. And it turns out, just by direct computation, that delta z goes like d naught. So the exact same combination of coefficients appears. And since we already proved that d naught is positive, that, impl that implies that delta z is positive. So that means that there exist black holes in the EFT that have q over m ever so slightly larger than 1. So the black holes themselves provide uh, the states necessary to prove the weak gravity conjecture. And in fact, a priori, you could have, you could have imagined that uh, if you plot q over m versus m, so here, the dotted line is just 1. That would be in pure Einstein-Maxwell theory. You, you would have expected uh, either the top or bottom curved line uh, to be the case. But what we proved is that it's the top, the top curved line that you get for the set of extremal black holes. So that means large extremal black holes can just decay to smaller extremal black holes, which can decay to yet smaller ones. And the entire tower just collapses to maybe one remnant in the UV completion or maybe to some uh, highly charged particles. But either way, the entire tower collapses and, and the weak gravity conjecture goes through. So this is in d equals 4 for 1u1. But it turns out that all of this immediately generalizes to the case of an arbitrary uh, number of u1s. So I showed previously uh, in, in earlier work with Cliff Chung that the appropriate generalization of the weak gravity conjecture that you expect uh, for, from black hole decay is that if you plot all the light states in charged mass ratio space, 
and form the convex hull. That convex hull should contain the unit ball corresponding to all the black hole states. So let's see how this works in, through the entropy argument. Since the metric only depends on the charge to mass ratio magnitude uh, and not its direction in charge to mass space, running through our earlier argument, you would find that in the extremal limit, uh, requiring that delta s be positive just implies that the black hole grows in the extremal limit, which you can also show implies that that ball of uh, black hole states expands in, in all directions in charge to mass space. It doesn't necessarily expand by the same amount. Uh, the couplings can be different. But since, it's ex since it expands in every direction, uh, that means that black holes of any charge uh, can decay. So even the generalized version of the weak gravity conjecture uh, can be proven in this way. All of this generalizes to arbitrary dimension very nicely. Uh, I, I won't show you the metric because it's, it's kind of uh, a complicated mess. But the final bound is still this nice uh, bound living in d naught d3, d6 space, where here d naught is some d-dimensional generalization of our particular combination of higher dimension operator coefficients. And so this bound is required to be satisfied for all psi uh, such that the black hole has positive specific heat. And you can, again, uh, take the extremal limit, and you get that d naught is positive. And you can compare this with how the black hole extremality condition shifts. And indeed, uh, the delta z in the EFT, again, goes like d naught. So the same combination of coefficients appears. And we, again, find that uh, the weak gravity conjecture in d dimensions is proven by this entropy argument. So aside from the weak gravity conjecture, we have this whole family of positivity bounds on higher dimension operator coefficients. So we should do some sanity checks to make sure that that family of bounds uh, makes sense. The first thing we can do is ask about field redefinition invariance. I could send the metric g mu nu uh, to g mu nu plus r mu nu or g mu nu plus uh, f squared mu nu. And so here, let me do an arbitrary field redefinition where here r1, 2, 3, and 4 are just arbitrary numbers. This has the net effect in the action of just shifting all the higher dimension operator coefficients. So each higher dimension operator coefficient is not by itself physically meaningful, but only four linear combinations of these operators are indeed field redefinition invariant. And those four linear combinations are d naught, d3, d6, and some other combination d9, uh, which, which didn't show up. So the total entropy shift delta s, and hence our bounds, were built out of d naught, d3, and d6, and hence everything that we derived is actually field redefinition invariant even though the individual terms in delta S, the delta S i and delta S h terms, were, were not field redefinition invariant on their own. The total uh, sum conspires to be physically meaningful. So another thing we can do is check concrete examples. So for example, let's turn off gravity and turn our bound just into a bound on photon-photon interactions. In that case, our bound just becomes 2d7 plus d8 is positive. But we know that we can bound photon-photon interactions via analyticity of scattering amplitudes, as shown in the, in the Adams et al. paper. And if you do that, if you run through uh, that argument, you get as one of your bounds that 2d7 plus d8 is positive. So our entropy bound is consistent with analyticity bounds. Another thing we can do is just take the example of a scalar UV completion with arbitrary couplings A phi and B phi. And in that case, we can just compute what the DIs are explicitly. And they're uh, shown here. And then our bound, d naught is positive, just becomes a perfect square. So in this example, UV completion, this is just manifestly uh, satisfied. Finally, we, sh we should go to string theory and, and make sure our bound is satisfied. So if we take, uh, for example, the heterotic string and compactify it down to d dimensions, uh, say compactify it on a torus or something, we can read off what the di's are, and we can plug these into our bound. And then our bound just becomes the requirement that this combination of d and xi be positive. But that, you can show, is positive for all xi and all d. So indeed, uh, in the case of the heterotic string, our bound is just manifestly satisfied. So I've presented a lot of results here, but just to, just to kind of sum up, what we've used is a Universal, universal notion of entropy, namely that adding extra microstates should increase the entropy. And we've, we've actually proven that using a Euclidean path integral argument that delta S should be positive. When we apply that to 
a charged black hole, we get a set of bounds on the higher dimension operator coefficients in the EFT. And that set of bounds contains among them one particular bound uh, that, that requires that a set of coefficients be positive in the EFT. And if that same set of coefficients is positive, we find that the black hole charge to mass ratio can be larger than one. And so the black holes themselves can provide what you need uh, to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. And we've seen how this generalizes to multiple gauge fields in arbitrary dimension, and it's completely agnostic about the structure of the UV completion, except for the assumption that uh, it's generated at tree level. There are a lot of future directions we could go with this. Uh, we could, of course, apply it to a broader class of theories. Uh, we could think about einstein dilaton gravity. We could apply this to other metrics. For example, we could put the black hole in ADS or DS, and we're thinking about that right now. Uh, we could consider Kerr or even black holes of non-spherical topology in higher dimension. Of course, that's, the latter is less tractable because uh, computing the corrections to the Einstein equations would be harder there. But more broadly, it would be interesting to understand the relationship between these entropy bounds and bounds from analyticity, unitarity, and causality. Uh, the reason why there might be a deep relationship is that uh, bounds from dispersion relations, analytic dispersion relations, are really about counting states in the UV. That's, that's where they're deriving their positivity. And similarly, the entropy bound is fundamentally about counting states in the UV. So there, there might be some, some deep relationship there. Another uh, conjectured uh, generalization that we discuss in the paper is that if you're imagining that you have a bunch of different mass shells that are hierarchically separated, you could imagine flowing from the UV to the IR and computing a differential version of our entropy bound. And indeed, you would have that DS should be positive as you pass through each mass shell. Furthermore, we think that our bound generalizes to loop level, and if indeed it's true at loop level, then delta S would be like an A theorem parameter uh, that would be capture, capturing RG flow, and it would grow monotonically from the UV to the IR. So that would be, that would be really cool to explore. It'd be nice to see if we could prove even extended versions of the weak gravity conjecture in this way, if we could connect this to uh, lattice or tower weak gravity conjectures. But the takeaway is that, I mean, obviously a lot of work remains to be done in separating the landscape from the swamp land, but infrared consistency can, uh, can work very well in synergy with, with UV efforts, and we continue to discover new tools for that. So thanks very much. I had a, a question. Uh, in the uh, sort of crucial point of your analysis was the assumption that the saddle point you found was a local minimum. Yeah. And that was what let you derive an inequality. Normally, when you compute the free energy of an unstable state or the Euclidean action of an, of an unstable state in, in, in the saddle point approximation, there's an imaginary part that tells you about the decay rate that comes from a negative mode. And I'm not talking about the conformal mode, but a physical negative mode. Right. So, so uh, yeah. So, there, there are two things about that. So, for one, Black holes that have charge to mass ratio bigger than, uh, than, the, than the crucial value, bigger than root three over two, are, are thermodynamically stable uh, at, at leading order in the perturbation theory. So the way that they're decaying uh, is through some gravitational instanton. So it's, it's some super highly suppressed uh, interaction. I, I mean, a, a, another way of maybe asking your question would be, you know, I've, I've assumed that the black hole is a mass eigenstate everywhere, and, you know, it secretly decays, so isn't there some imaginary part of the mass? Uh, and yes, there is, but it's, it's so highly suppressed since it's uh, some, you know, it's the black hole decaying to other black holes that, that it doesn't matter for the analysis. Okay, I have a conceptual question and a technical one. Okay. Uh, the conceptual question is your analysis apply for a black hole up to a certain radius. Yeah. So, so how do you break the infinite number of stable states? You imagine that all of them have to decay through this window? Uh, no, so, right. So, so there are two steps to the analysis. One is that we consider a particular black hole background. Uh, so we consider a black hole within a particular radius window, and we use that to prove a bound on the coefficients of the EFT. But once we have a bound on the coefficients of the EFT, that bound is a statement about the action, which is now true independent of the background. So I can then apply that uh, statement about the coefficients to the black hole of arbitrary size and, uh, and compute what its, uh, what its correction to the charge to mass ratio is. Uh, the technical question is, I had a hard time understanding delta S diverges when you go to the extremal case. Right. And I think possibly uh, when you do the analysis, there's an expansion.
and when you are at the extremal limit, sometimes vanishes. You have to go to the next order. And I think Tushifumi tried to do this uh, expansion to the next order, and we don't seem to find this divergence in entropy. Okay, that that would be interesting. Um, we we talk about this in in much more detail in the paper that I had than I had time to. But the the point I was making is that. You can take psi very, very small while still taking psi much larger than m phi over m Planck, since m phi is supposed to be parametrically small compared to m Planck. And when you, when you do that, then delta s over s and delta beta over beta are both uh, as small as you like. So that's, that's what I meant by uh, the perturbation theory is still under control. Right, it would it, be, be cool to go to next to leading order, yeah. Uh, sorry, maybe I... Oh. Maybe I missed it, but in the case with multiple U1s, you have yeah. a convex hull, and how are the vectors which build up the convex hull defined, at least in your case? I mean, which are the physical states which define the convex hull? Ah, okay, good. So, right. So, a priori, we, we don't have any light states in this set. We're, we're imagining that there's no electron, there are just black holes, and we're pointing out that to zeroth order in perturbation theory, the extremal black holes are just some sphere. And if you compute what uh, the extremal black holes are in the EFT, uh, delta Z, remember, shifts. And now delta Z uh, has, has direction dependence. And what we show is that in every direction in charge space, uh, that sphere has to grow. So the black holes of finite mass, not infinite mass, have delta Z magnitude bigger than, uh, bigger than zero everywhere. So, delta, uh, so z magnitude bigger than one in every direction in charge space. So that forms, if you like, the, the convex hull of the finite mass black holes. Uh, so, so Mao, in, uh, in your construction, this convex hull is built up directly by the black holes themselves. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, are you arguing for the sharpened version or of the regular version of weak gravity conjugation? The regular version, just that there's some state with Q over M bigger than one. No, sharpened meaning greater than or equal or equal. Equality is... Oh, oh, I see. Uh, I, I, I thought you meant minimum mass. Um, so if, if all of the DIs are zero, then, then obviously uh, delta S is zero here. But if any of the DIs are non-zero, since that, since that D naught term contained, contained, you know, most of the DIs in it. If any of them are non-zero, we get, we get something positive. Right, if, if there's, in other words, yeah, if there's some flat direction in, uh, in the Euclidean action, then, then it's just, uh, de then delta S is zero. So we're assuming that there's no flat direction. So super, you don't think about supersymmetry specific? Right, yeah, th this, is, this is assuming we're breaking supersymmetry. But you cannot argue if you break it, it has to be positive. So that's something we haven't thought about. So in, a, in other words, you're saying break Susie, but somehow have some flat direction in, uh, in the Euclidean action. Uh, we'd have to think about that more. I have one. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about the extrapolation to uh, the particle limit in this picture you had. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, So the charge to mass ratio looks like it's going to infinity for particles. Well, you, 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 can't, take, you can't take m to zero here, right? Uh, m is the black hole mass. You can only take m down to uh, you know, the Planck scale, for example. And yeah. at that point, you know, the UV completion takes over, and we don't know what happens. So, so could, could it just turn down? Or, I mean, can you say I mean, Yeah, it could. It could. The... There, there, are, there are a priori two possibilities. Either Either this continues going up and up beyond the Planck scale and maybe you know, goes to the standard model electron or something, or maybe uh, it turns over. And if it turns over, that means the entire tower can decay down to uh, that maximum point. And maybe you have one stable remnant, uh, but you don't have the entire tower of stable remnants, provided delta S is, is strictly positive. So I, I, I don't know what the motivation for black holes to decay that you're thinking about, but if it's a remnant argument, then I would have thought remnants are Planckian size objects, so I don't see how that, that's in the regime where you're saying you can't calculate things. So. Well, we, we don't want to make a remnant argument. All I'm saying is that there, there are two possibilities. Either this continues going up or it turns over. But either way, uh, the entire tower, except for the, possibly the endpoint of the tower, gets to decay. Uh, 
And the I'm end point saying, of the if tower... You off, if you cut off your argument at some uh, classical black hole much bigger than the Planck mass, mm -hmm. then how do you know that there are no remnants? Because uh, you're Well, to... we, we shouldn't cut off the argument at some, at some classical black hole. We should cut off the argument at where the classical theory is breaking down. Okay, uh, we can discuss later. Right. Okay, so let's thank... Thank <laughs> you.